Welcome to Boundless Pursuit, a weekly podcast providing motivation, entertainment, and education to anglers and outdoorsmen. I hope that the stories you'll find here will encourage you to chase your passion more fervently, to open your mind to new opportunities and perspectives. Your engagement and feedback is critical to the growth of this show, and I would love to hear your suggestions on topics or potential guests. You can reach me at boundlesspursuitfishing at gmail.com or at my website, www.boundless-pursuit.com. That's where you'll find all related articles, media, and merchandise. Please remember, the show will gain traction from your support. Be sure to like, comment, and share this podcast to your friends and connections. I'm your host, David Graham. Now let's get on to today's episode. A major theme that I want to establish early in this podcast is dispelling this utterly ridiculous concept that we have across this country of trash fish. The idea that we would categorize any native species of fish in fresh or salt water as trash is completely ridiculous. It is a old school mentality that has got to die off once and for all. And every opportunity that I have to dispel the myths and just the false ideas that float around out there that have led certain species to be kept kind of tucked away in those shadows and being called trash fish or undesirable species, uh, I'm going to highlight those things and tear down those ideas. This is a term that I have battled since my inception as an angler. And while most of my personal experience as an angler has been in freshwater, where the idea of trash fish seems to abound at every corner. I'm finding now since moving to Florida and getting more involved in saltwater that saltwater too has its trash fish. And among those insanely is the Jack Creval. I don't know if the issue is just sheer abundance of the species or their lack of table fare. Now we can sit here and argue how palatable the fish is, but the one thing that can't be argued is that these things fight damned hard. It is an indisputable fact that even the biggest haters simply have to submit to. The Jack Creval is pound for pound one of the strongest fish in all of saltwater. Now, like many people, my personal experience with the Jack Creval has not been much more than dealing with the occasional groups of 10, 15 pounders at the high end, blitzing on massive fields of bait fish. But people need to understand that this is a species of fish that can get monstrous and curiously. While they have all the same sporting qualities, characteristics, and even physical appearance of their more notorious and globally sought-after cousin, the giant Trevally, Jack Creval have still largely failed to catch on in the mainstream. But the guy that you're going to hear from today has taken what's already a pretty hard-fighting fish at its average size, and he has broken through and revealed a whole other level that these species can get to. On Instagram, he's David Rocca. And while Instagram serves to be a great snapshot of the absolutely massive jacks that this guy catches and physical proof of what he can do with a rod and reel and how big these fish can get, I didn't realize the layers of his development as a man and as an angler until we had this conversation. David immigrated to the U.S. from Cuba at a very young age, and his story outlines a very hard reset and growth as an angler from a really interesting perspective. In Cuba, he was fishing with very limited resources, and it was essentially sustenance fishing. Cane poles, hand lines, having basically nothing. And during the course of this conversation, he really highlights his journey as an angler coming to America, adapting to a rod and a reel, and growing in his hardware and upgrading his gear, ultimately mastering the pursuit specifically of these massive Jack Creval from land with giant artificial lures, giant plugs, much like you see with the giant Trevally. I'd go so far as to say that David Rocca is more dialed in on giant jacks than anyone else that you will find. Not only is this a guy that I had a really good time hearing from and someone who paints a really vivid picture of growth as an angler, this is also somebody I'm very eager personally to go and fish with. When I look at the photos of the jacks that this guy catches and the aftermath of them burning through drag, destroying tackle, straightening hooks, 
and just causing pure chaos, I'm very eager to acquire the necessary gear and link up with this guy in the very near future. I'm hoping that by the time that this episode is dropped, we will have been able to get together because this is a type of fishing that I think you're going to find really interesting from a very humble guy from very humble beginnings, and you are not going to want to miss this one. David Rocca, I'm glad to have you on here. Uh, been a fan for a while. I know I ran across your page. I think I think it was you know your your main uh, your main deal is those giant jacks from land, yeah. those huge lures that you're throwing. Um, that's how I that's how I found you. I don't know if that's been like kind of become part of your identity, but I know that's how I know you. But but man, I, I knew when I was putting this podcast together, you were one of like the top guys in mine because I feel like what you're doing is like. You're not really chasing the rarest of fish, but uh, the way that you're doing it really, really interests me. And, and that's kind of like been part of the motivation behind reaching out to you. But but you got to tell me about this surf fishing, surf casting, land based. I don't know what you want to call it, but yeah. popping, popping. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a it's a mixture. Right? You got to you got to be where, where the fish are at mainly. The jacks, have, have you have you seen a jack before, like, in the water? They go crazy. Like, they, they yes. move side to side. They, they're always running. Like, yeah, they're so, fishing a bait fish. So I, I have not lived in Florida long. Like, four years. So, I've mm-hmm. like, you know, prior to me living here, I was mostly a freshwater guy. It just, yeah. But, you know, I mean, I still dabbled in saltwater. I lived in South Carolina, and I lived in Corpus Christi for a while in Texas. So I was like, you know, I eased into the saltwater thing here and there, but still... I mean, I'm still, you know, a novice, but uh, the jacks, I mean, we have them here in Southwest Florida. I live in, I live in Naples, but I mean, I fish around the Caloosahatchee and around Fort Myers and Sanibel and all our, all our areas. And we have jacks, but nothing like the ones that I'm seeing you pull, like not even in the, not even the same wavelength of fish. Like totally, it's almost like, I'm wondering if there's like a, like subspecies bit, but yeah, I, I see the way that they go crazy blitzing. And like out of nowhere, there'll be times where I'm even up in like fresh water. It's weird. It's really weird. I'll be sitting there on a peaceful day, you know, maybe relaxing in the canoe and out of nowhere, it's like a football field size, like, oh wow, like eruption of chaos goes off. And, and these, these jacks are blowing up like crazy. Um, so, I mean, that's, it's easy to get excited about them. So when I, when yeah. I start doing a little yeah, bit of is. Google searching or, or browsing social media, and then I see, these colossal monsters that you're catching. I was like, Oh my God, that things look like GTs. Work. So I'm, I'm interested. Work. I'm really, I'm interested in like where that began. Like, like I, I'm always interested to kind of know people's like formation as an angler, or like yeah. where they started, but just tell me how you got into that scene. Well, uh, I, I started, uh, at the lowest, basically. I'm, I'm from Cuba. I am, I grew up in the Sierra in Cuba, so like the mountains. And over there, like we used to, we, we fished with traditional headlines. So in the Sierras, uh, you got this on the water wells. And when it rains, just like a river forms and all of the, like the big shrimp. Have you, have you seen those big shrimps, the freshwater shrimps that are like 15 inches, like 20 inches? Yeah, I've seen the pictures of them. Is that where they're yeah, getting them? We used to get bags and bags of those. And <laughs> when it used to flow like very heavily, the catfish would also come out of the caves from the from the Sierra. And you would just go there on the next morning with the machete and like cut them and throw them into, <laughs> into the bag. And just basically get as much as you could. And you bring it home, give it to some friends. And everything was getting eaten. So back then, like when that did happen, it was just in headlines. We used to fish with hand lines, we used to get a crab or an eel or a shrimp and fish with catfish, tilapia. We used to have um, something similar to snake it, but they, I think they called them um, big mouth um, sleepers. Okay, yeah, well, we yeah. Can have those here in Florida now, so. Yeah, but um, the ones in Cuba, they, they grow really big. Oh, okay. They have a lot of meat, so that was the top price fish that <laughs> you could ever get, like, you could ever catch and I did that I started fishing since I was like one my dad used to take me out to fish and he used to tie me up 
by the waist. You'll find the tree, tie me up by the waist with the long rope so that I couldn't get close enough to the water. So that when I get oh down there, God. With a big fish, you know, because you're facing hand lines and you can't really let it go because, like, you probably have like 50, 70 yards of line. It was very hard back then to, like, find fishing line and hooks. We used to make our own. And I did that until I was 13 that I came to, to the United States. And oh, I came wow. here and I I didn't know what the fish were because, like, I used to log into YouTube and seeing all of these YouTubers catching peacock bass and bass yeah, and yeah. <laughs> snook. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, who is you for catfishing here? You know, like, I got to I gotta meet those guys. Right. Back then, Cuba catfish was all there was because it took over everything. It took over all of the um, species over there. It ate them up. Yeah, catfish will do that. That it's like salt water, yeah. fresh water. You know, I was talking to a buddy of mine, uh, a, a friend of mine. Uh, his guy's a guy named Josh Dolan. He lives up in Virginia. He's been kind of like my partner in all of this. Um, so, like when people watch my podcast or whatever, they, they're going to be seeing him a lot. But anyway, uh, I've gone up there and fished with him a few times and and I went up there for the very first time to fish with him for snakeheads of all things, northern yeah. snakeheads, not like what we have down here. Um in like these tidal marshes in Virginia. And like the northern snakeheads the one that like made all the news, made all the big buzz. Mm -hmm. And you know, I go up there kind of thinking, okay, well, you know, this is frankenfish, you know, this is this place is going to be out of control. It's going to be snakeheads all over the place jumping in the yeah. boat trying to bite us. And I quickly realized they have a much bigger problem where he's at with blue catfish. It is, it is, and yeah. I don't want to like, I don't want to hijack the topic that we're on, but I just had to mention it. The, the catfish that he deals with in like the Chesapeake Bay area and just uh, the different rivers that they have. I mean, there uh, you could walk across these things. They were in like yeah. six inches of water. <laughs> They're in forty feet of water. You can catch them on top water. You can catch them on the bottom yeah. on lures on baits. It's just it was it's a horrible horrible thing. Way worse than the snakeheads. I think I yeah. think they alone are probably standing in the way of those snakeheads from ever taking off because those blue catfish there are out of control. But but uh, that's interesting. I did not know that about you. I mean I I had gathered that you're Cuban, but it's uh I love a yeah. story like that where there's like humble beginnings, especially for fishermen. I think if you start mm -hmm. if you start at like that level, like the I mean I just feel like when you have that kind of story, your appreciation for the kind of fishing that we have now is probably oh, yeah. way bigger than, you know, hell, I mean, we live in Florida. It's like, it's a lot of yeah. rich, rich kids out there fishing um, that may not appreciate what they have uh, to the same degree. But, uh, yeah, I, but I, you know, like when you're a fisherman, I, like it's in your blood. Like my dad yeah. taught me it. Like I was seven, eight years old and I was sneaking out the house <laughs> whenever it yeah. would rain. Go to the river, get catfish, sell them, whatever. I used to make more than my dad, and my dad was a, uh, num he was an awarded number one ophthalmologist in Latin America twice. Oh wow, okay. And I used to make more money than him because I used to go cat to get catfish, and I used to sell it for for dog food and that kind of stuff. Because <laughs> in Cuba, even though it's like you're a top doctor, you're doing like 20, 30 eye surgeries a day. You're still making a dollar a day. Oh, wow. Even if you're a doctor. So I used to go and fish, and I used to make money, and I used to joke around with him. I'm like, hey, you're going to have to join me one of these days. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, no, I've so, seen your pictures. I know I was scrolling. I mean, I scrolled all the way to the bottom of your page looking looking yeah. at uh, looking at all your stuff, and I know I'd, I'd seen some pictures that I meant to ask about. It looks like you were like maybe you had gone back. I don't know. You're like holding sticks. You and a couple other guys like sticks, like cane poles. Oh, yeah. Or, yeah, they were doing that's, something. That's was, that, was that a visit home? Was that just tapping yeah, into the roots? That's a home. Um, you Over there, you have two options. You can fish with the hand line. The problem is there's no market over there. Like You can't get hand lines. Like long hand lines, it would only be if they send it from the U.S. So what you uh, do okay. is if you get like 50 yards of hand line, you can cut it into a piece and make like a 10-foot rod, tie it to the tip. And now you can reach into some like pockets or like um, spots and just put it down with a with a buoy on, get mm -hmm. a bite, swing out the fish. Yeah. <laughs> and that, I mean, not having the proper tackle, like it, it like it 
created like certain situations that were that you were like, no way. Like for example, mm, we used to get tarpon in Cuba, but the way we used to get it, it was it was insane. Uh, we didn't have long lines, so we used a tin rope and a hook made out of a made out of steel uh, from a friend of ours, and basically you would hook a tilapia uh-huh. into the hook, you throw it into the current, and you tie that line to a horse. You couldn't tie it to yourself, but the tarpon wasn't gonna. Wasn't Did you gonna say to a me. horse? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, this is you, awesome. You couldn't tie it to yourself because, like, you were going to get pulled in. So we tied it to the horse. We got the bite and we hit the horse. <laughs> we were on top of the horse. We hit the horse and the horse pulled out the tarpon. We used to do that and, and, and it was oh my the gosh. greatest thing ever. I would like, pay as soon to see as you that. that tarpon, it would be like a jet ski. <laughs> it, it's, it's such a backwards world we live in that the, I feel like the people that are over there would like would like die to come and fish with the kind of gear that we have yeah. here. And that yet here I am, I have the gear and the resources at my disposal, but like I would give anything to go and like see that in person. That's yeah. crazy. That's, that's it was, awesome it was, though. It was very raw. I feel like when, when you, uh, I don't know. I feel like if you get good with gear like that, you probably get really damn good with gear. That's more advanced. So it's probably a good thing to kind of yeah. build like your appreciation for fishing on a foundation like that. Um, that's, I, I, that's I would exactly think, what happened to me. Yeah, I would think that it's much, much more fulfilling for somebody like you to to come here and ha- and have the different sort of resources. But I'm curious, like, so when you travel, like when you visit home or whatever, you can't bring the gear you have now, or do they not let so you, or I, you just just don't do, don't bother with it? I I came to the United States in 2013, mm-hmm. and I went back uh, once, and it was to see my my grandmother. She was she was dying, and I had to go there and say goodbye. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I fished for one day for, because, like, my old friends they were dragging me out the house, like carrying me, yeah. like, let's go, let's go, let's go. Yeah. I said, yeah, you got fish in the U.S., so you gotta come here and teach us how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I bought them some some hairlines and a lot of hooks and everything, and they were the happiest that they could be. You oh know? yeah. Well, you were like, you were like the Cuban Santa Claus then yeah, show up and give him a much. bunch of gear. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Oh, that's much. awesome. Yeah. I saw that picture and I'm like, I got to ask about what that's, what that's all about, but that's good. It's like, I, and I've been kicking around this idea. I tell my wife all the time. I'm like, for some reason, like I, you know, obviously I plan out like different kind of trips every year that I want to go and do, but like for yeah. some reason, like, like deep within like my soul, I want to like map out a trip like weeks long to just travel yeah. the country to all the places I used to fish when I was a kid. I yeah. like like for whatever reason as the years go on, I have like this greater desire just to go back and like stand where I like where I learned yeah. to fish. Yeah. And it's like I don't know, I I almost desire doing that more than going to some of these remote places, but it's like I don't know, I feel like you need that sort of reset every now and then to kind of yeah. to keep to keep you grounded, to keep you, you appreciating to... what you're doing. Yeah, you, you, you kind of need to go back to, to where you started. And I do that very often, um, but we'll get to that in later. So, like, mainly uh, after I came to the United States, uh, it was a very tough time. It was um, four of us, me, my little sister, my dad, my mom. And in Cuba, they were top doctors. But in here, uh, my dad had to work at a Red Lobster cleaning dishes for two years. And while going to nursing school, while while going to nursing school, so like the first two years in the U.S., we lived in one room apartment, oh, two wow. beds on the floor, a little kitchen, and my dad would go into work around six p.m. and he would come back on like maybe maybe like six in the morning again. He used to sleep a little bit, and during the day he used to go to school. So like he would get like four or five hours of sleep. Mm-hmm. while well, working and going to school and learning English and my mom used to take me to school and it was this big deal that like you gotta work your ass off until right. you get into some stable I mean into some stability you know because when you go to the country every, everything is new you gotta start from scratch and what happened was that the 20 years or the 20 something years that my parents lived in Cuba and studied over there it all came to zero they have to start all over again. Yeah, so it might yeah. be a top dog there and starting from zero. That's, That's wild. insane. And 
after after those three years, they took their nursing exams and they passed the board. Like you can speak to them in English, and they won't even understand you. But <laughs> they passed right. the board. <laughs> yeah. Somehow on on the first try. So for those two years, uh, I I couldn't really fish. I couldn't do anything. Uh, I mm -hmm. I used to be this kid that was outside of his house all all day. I would go to school, come back from school, eat something, then I'm out again. I'm going right, fishing. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's 9 p.m. and I'm not home and everybody's looking for me because I'm fishing. And then get back home, get grounded, go to school, and then <laughs> fish after school <laughs> yeah. so that they were not. <laughs> and then come back home and come here and for two years staying in, in a room by yourself. Oh, suck. It really sucked. It, it yeah. changed me a lot. I used to have friends over there. Everybody knew me, and and here you have to start from zero. You have right. to develop a new personality, and mm, I realized that like how much I really changed when I went back to Cuba after eight years, mm -hmm. when nobody recognized me. I didn't like mm, his mm, Spanish songs. I didn't like. Uh, I mean, I completely changed. I like yeah. like I say, I Americanized myself. I started listening to rock and all of that, and <laughs> it, it was it was a really big change for me. And I uh, I think that fishing got me got me through like the toughest part of mm, my life, really, because like after those two years, we we kind of got some oxygen, you know, from less work and and just less pressure from the from a from an economic perspective, you know. And after that, I, I started going out with my dad, and we used to fish in the canals and, and Humpstead. That's where we started. Okay. And we used to throw headlines. And there were these big carts that we couldn't figure out how to catch. We'd throw worms. We'd throw the chicken guts. <laughs> yeah, that's got to be the big grass carp, huh? We'd throw shrimp. <laughs> the same <laughs> things that we tried in Cuba. And we would never figure them out. One day, we got there in the afternoon, and there was this lady throwing bread the ducks oh yeah and then comes the cars and just eats their bread and i'm like wow <laughs> went to the general we got a piece of bread threw the headline in and then it go boom bring it in finding it big carp and like we had never had like a fish of that size before like in here yeah. and it was the craziest thing ever and we started doing that for like a year more and we used to go there in the in the afternoons and we used to get this big cars with with hand lines and then i think it was on my 15th birthday one of my uncles he he gave me a fishing rod and i started using it and i got i got good with it and now like my dad used to fish with hand lines and i used to fish with with, with rods and i would get to the fish a little bit faster than him because i used to cut further than all yeah <laughs> and then my dad tried the <laughs> The fishing rod and he couldn't deal with it. it uh, I, right, I, yeah. was out, I was out fishing him every time, <laughs> you know. Like I was the one teaching him now how to fish. Mm -hmm. And we moved to West Palm Beach and and over here, like we have the the ocean like 15 minutes away. And I was like uh, 16, 17, uh, yeah, 16 years old. And then that's when the flat water started. That's when I started fishing for jacks. I, I had a friend of mine. He knew that I liked to fish, so he's like, I'm gonna take you to catch jacks. He he wasn't on the same level that I am right now as knowledge. He mainly did it because like uh you can get a mullet, put it on the hook, and you would catch like five pound jacks very easily. Mm -hmm. And I started there, but I started with headlines. So I didn't have rods. Like he did, and oh, that sounds dangerous. <laughs> the first day that I got there, it was it was a mullet run. I didn't know what what mullet run was. I had no <laughs> idea what it was. I get there and I see this water bowling. I'm like, what is that thing? <laughs> 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 and then I see this big school of jacks come in, and I hook a mullet and put it down. Back jacks smokes on my line. Like I was just in twenty pound line. So oh, imagine yeah. that, like. I lost that jack and I was bleeding after after I lost it because the the hairline it cut me so deep I just couldn't stop it. Oh yeah. And that day I I didn't land a fish 
it, it was all like smoking me like <laughs> I was getting burns on 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 my fingers and he was he was he was doing okay he was catching like five ten pounders and back then that was a really big fish for me yeah and so I did that and I finally saved enough money to like get a rod but I was still like my rods weren't weren't good enough like a 3500 size reel and like a mm, ugly stick whatever when those just yeah. coming in, oh man <laughs> forget about it they will they will they will smoke me right yeah and and then i'm like i started going with my dad and he's like you know what we gotta do you gotta get some wire we gotta get some heavy line <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we're gonna get <laughs> we went there with 60 pound mono and some wire like back then like my dad taught that salt water you would fish with wire and that was the only thing that you used because yeah. the fish would break you off so i fished with, mm, with wire and we used to go like this in mm, 10 pounders or so and it was and it was fun but that year when it got colder around on december that's when the big fish started showing up mm-hmm. and we couldn't land one we would hook this <laughs> big jacks and we just couldn't land it we couldn't land it and my dad got got like really like fed up. It's like, all right, he he's he's always like conservative about saving money and all. He's like, I'm done. We're gonna go to Dick's. We're gonna buy a hundred pound mono, <laughs> <laughs> number ten wire, a shark hook, and we're gonna land one of these jacks today. <laughs> so we get there early to the to the to the, to this bridge and and West Palm Beach. It was the outgoing tide, and I get laid because, and that's and and that was the main bait back then. We hooked the ladyfish head, throw it out, and the jacks they would they would eat that that caught bait better than live mullet. Oh wow! The big ones they're a little more they're lazier than the younger ones. Like the big big jacks, like the forty pounders, they are lazy fish. They they would chase the bait, but if they have an easy meal, they will take it. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, and I'll get to, to, to that in, in a moment. Yeah. So that day, he, he put the gloves on, like this <laughs> construction worker's glove. <laughs> he got a hairline. I got a hairline. He gets the bike first and starts bringing the fish, and the fish are taking hard runs, but like really hard. And what happens is when you got mono, you hold the line like this, and yeah. you're expected to go in a like straight, like when it's, when it's pulling. But what happens is when you got a lot of pressure and you hold the mono, it goes like this. And uh, the mono, like you hold them and the mono is gone like that. Let me show you. Like this. And what happens is that mono is heading over here. Oh, man. And with that jack, you should take a run. I mean, you couldn't do much. slapping. You, you have to let it go. <laughs> you have to let go of the mono. <laughs> You're going to hold it. And... We land the fish, and when I look at my dad, he was he was bleeding, like he had as as if it was a whip on 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 his hand, and I still got scars. Oh day. my gosh, yeah. That was five, and that was six years ago, probably. Well, those are good story yeah. starters right there, like tattoos. We landed that fish, and then I hooked another one next night. That that next night, and I was and I was bleeding out. I was <laughs> I, had, I had I had scars everywhere, and I, I mean, that was, I was, I was happy because like we finally got that big fish. I was getting away. That's, that's the big thing about fishing. I like the big fish gets away. Oh yeah, like, yeah. How do I get better? How do I get my tackle better? How do I get that fish? And like, we started doing that, and sometimes like, it was like tough to land them with the airline because it was an outgoing tide, and the tide was coming into the bridge. So you hook a jack out there and would go under the bridge. Mm. And you're done. He's gonna cut you off, even if you have a hundred pound mono. Yeah, it would just cut you off with the, with the bridge, and you couldn't do much. But <laughs> we figured out that if you hook the jack, bring it closer, who go under the bridge, who let it go past the bridge, and I would get a rod and with the jig. Throw a jig, snag the mono, and fight him from the other end. <laughs> That's outrageous. It used, <laughs> <laughs> used to get it out like that. 
and we did that for for a while until I was like um, 17 years old, and then I got better fishing rods, and I started with the artificial stuff, uh, like in throwing throwing small lures, just catching five pounders, and so and and so on. And then I got to a point that I was like, how do I get this big fish? I I needed to find how to get those those big fish because like even even the hand light it wasn't doing it anymore. Yeah. So I'm like. In Cuba, I used to get, I mean, we used to get this big carpet with just a piece of line. <laughs> How come I'm not landing this? And they're like, oh, I got to go back in time. You know, I went to Home Depot. I got myself a rope. Just, yeah. <laughs> I, went to, I went to the shop. I got a piece of 200-pound model. I got a big hook. And I stood there on top of the bridge waiting for the tire to switch with the live motor like this. Mm-hmm. Like 15 inches. Hook it on the top over here. Put that motor down. And that jack came up. Bah! <laughs> straight in. And I was like, I was, I was on to the, to, to the hairline and he was just burning me. Was, I stopped it. Bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. I tried putting it into the net. It didn't fit in the net. Oh was, my gosh. It was a bridge net. It, we, we knew that that was gonna happen eventually. It just didn't fit. It didn't fit. It didn't fit. And then I finally get it. The net rips out. And then I was I was just stuck in there. And thankfully, the, there was another fisherman close by. He he let me use his net, put it in, finally got it out. When I got that jack, it, it was like 42, 43 pounds. It's huge. Oh wow, that's monster! I hold it and I lift it up like that, and I took a picture of it and sent it to my dad. And, he didn't know what I did. He's like, how do you do that alone? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, when, when we are a team, you know, we still can cut an animal. We cut an animal just too much. And then I sent him a picture and he laughed. He he laughed a lot. He's like, yeah, you're, you're a monster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then after that, I, I, I kind of got confident. I got really confident with the hand like this. Like, yeah. There wasn't a jack that could get away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't a jack that could get away from that bridge. And until, until like one day I was, um, I, I started using um, a hundred, a hundred pound leader on the, on the, on that rope. I started with a hundred and a hundred and twenty five. Until one day it, it was in, on May. That's when the big one showed up. I put down a mullet. And I hooked it like a maybe a thirty-five pounder. Got it out, released it. I hooked another one, released it, and then it got really rough. I, that, that was like around eleven a.m. and it got really rough and that day. I ran out of bait. I went back to the to the shore, started and cast netting some mullet, and I couldn't get anything that day. So I cut it, and I, I went back and next week. And I tried catching mullet, and it was really hard, really hard. I spent the whole day trying to get a damn mullet. I, I I couldn't get one. And then I, I I finally got one around like 5 p.m. And and I'm like, all right, this is my ticket. And it was May. I knew the big fish were gonna be there. I went to the top of the bridge, put the mullet down. Nothing. Nothing. 5 p.m. 6 p.m. Nothing. Right around 8 p.m., it starts getting dark. My mother is in there like <laughs> for like three hours. <laughs> <laughs> that thing was deep. <laughs> and this huge jack, like I've I've never seen one that big. Two of them, they come up at the same time for the bait. It, they were they were like probably like 50 pounders. I've I've oh never seen one that big like before. They come up, they they eat the mullet. I set the hook on it. And it was just talking me and talking me and talking me, and it bent the hook. I'm like, wow. Oh man! So my confidence was at the top, and the hook bent out and went. I'm like, man, yeah, that really hurt me. And then I, I kind of like, I missed that chance because like it had been like a year, and like a couple of months for me doing doing the same thing over and over, trying right. trying to catch that fish. 
and I lost it. So I went home. I started doing push-ups, trying trying to get stronger, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I I did push-ups for like a week. I I went back. I I bought a one twenty five mono. Went back at it again, but the fishes weren't there. They I I was I was I was trying the fishes weren't there. I tried with chunks, mm-hmm. with live bait. The fishes weren't there, and during during August, I <clears throat> I go with my dad and. And we we tried the same thing, and we were getting like smaller fish, but like that that elusive big fish that that you're looking for, it just you couldn't find it again. And then I kind of like we we kind of switched to like catching bluefish and that sort of thing until like the right time before for for the big jacks will 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 come in, and then. You know, I, I kind of like back down from it and then I stopped doing it because I'm like, I lost a big one. I'm I'm, I'm not going to try for a while because like I'm going to have to wait until next year. Right. Yeah. And then we started catching bluefish. Uh, but the issue is that when you're chunking bait, you don't know what's going to eat it. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You're throwing a big piece of ladyfish, big piece of mullet, like anything good, come in and eat it. Right, and then you know during July, August, September, that's that's the time for the big snook. So what mm-hmm. happen is, we should throw a chunk trying to get a bluefish, and the snook will come in, and we'll just get these forty snooks back to back. And right, my yeah. dad used to look at me. I used to look at my dad. Like, what do we do? We got to release this thing. And my dad used to jump around and like, get get mad because like we had to release it, but like I'm like hey. yeah. We can't risk anything for this, so we got to release it. And then one day I was in, I was fishing for, for moonfish, you know, like six pound line, crappy jigs. And there was this big snook on, on, on one light of the bridge. And there was this, this guys that were trying to get snook, you know, like with swim baits and the big yeah, gear yeah. and all of that. And I'm there with like six, six pound mono and my my hand lines in 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 a bucket. Yeah. And they looked at me like I said like what are you doing? Yes. <laughs> you know, and I told I told one of the guys, there's a big snook on the second light. If you go from the left side of the bridge, you cast out it up current, you bring in the lure, most likely you're gonna hook that fish. And he did that, and then a couple of minutes later, I I see him screaming at me, "Hey, come over, come over, help me out!" I went there. He was like a forty-inch snook. I'm like, "Wow, that's a nice one." He caught it on a lure. That's that's impressive. And then I told him, "Can I take a picture of it to send it to my dad?" He's like, "No, man, just catch your own fish." Oh, jeez. Like, All right. The thing is that, like that guy, he didn't even brought a net. I was the one that used my net to land his fish. He said, catch your own fish. And I was like, all right. And that that really got to me. Yeah. It's like, you know, like I didn't have the money to buy none of that gear or, or anything like that. And he did right. something that I used to see on the on the internet and YouTube. Yeah. I'm like, wow, it's it's real. Like that started happening. And the way that he responded to me, I, I didn't like that at all. So Yeah, that's that's disappointing there. Yeah, yeah. So I went home and I told my neighbor about it. He said, like, here, use this shark rod. It was like a 12 foot and shark rod. And he gave me a reel. And I went there the next night. I got a big ladyfish, free line it, put it down. Fine, big snook. It was, it was like mm, 40, 41 inches. Got yeah, it out of Tried it again. Bang. I did that for for like three four months, and I was catching. Uh, I was I was very effective at it. I I, I was catching one two snooks on the forty inch mark just about every night. Yeah. And I started posting it on Instagram, and then I get all of this attention. Like, how do you get it? How do you get it? How do you get it? <laughs> yeah. And that's how I came up with the name like David Rockman. And mm-hmm. I started posting this pictures of snook, and people didn't know how to get them. And I was using the the light baiting and. 
it was it was it was it was tough to get him because I mean it's it's a big fish it's hard to pull, but I was giving it the one thing that they couldn't resist and it was, it's like a 15 yeah. 20 inch lady fish, and that's when I got the idea of like for big fish if I want the big fish I'm gonna have to start using big tackle. Yeah, there's there's no other way around it. Just big tackle and big tackle, and then I got mm, obsessed with it. And then I said, "How do I catch the biggest jack that that I can?" I mean, I was I was pretty much over the the handline stuff. I I, I wanted to grow as as an as an fisherman. Yeah, yeah. And my my issue also was that I was I was fishing the one bridge for five years. I didn't do anything else because I yes. I fished with my dad, and back then I didn't have a car. I didn't have anything. I used to fish with headlines and I just couldn't do it. I mean, I was I, I was in high school. I couldn't get a job. I couldn't do anything. So I was I was really good at it. I was really good at that bridge, but I couldn't move anywhere else. Right, right. And the issue with that is that even if you try to fish with somebody, they will go into the rod, into the jigs, and back then I just I just couldn't afford it. I just couldn't do anything. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, I was I was catching bigger fish than than all of them together. Mm -hmm. They they weren't even like my 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 shallow as and as and as they said. And then, I, in, in high school, I I got a job at at, at Publix. Started saving money. I got myself a rod. Yeah. I started like, you know, on on Instagram and just learning what people are doing, like with the jigs and with the fluorocarbon, whatever. <laughs> and with the braid and this and that and i started working on it and on and on and then i was pretty much like catching fish around the same size but i was still there at the bridge and i was and i also got pretty good with an artificial and but i was just there i was just in one spot i i wasn't growing any longer like you would talk about David and be like, oh, he fishes at this place and nobody can beat him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My friends used to say, dude, you got to get off that bridge. Yeah. You got to get off. You got to explore. And that was that was around three years ago. And I switched. I completely switched. I, I started into college. I got my car, got my rods, and I started experiencing it like, I knew how the jacks would behave at the bridge. I knew what time they come in, what to use, what tides, but I didn't know about anything else. Yeah, yeah. I was that was that was my niche. I I didn't know about anything about anything else, and I started watching this and this guys from Australia, like the GT Buster, yep, Brooksy, and all those, and the GTs. They're pretty similar to jacks, and I would say, wow, I always wanted to get. Some of this fish on 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 a on a lure, and I was just trying to figure out who's catching those fish. Like who were who were catching? Like who was doing what I wanted to do? Who's catching the big jacks on the big lures? And when you look up like in in YouTube, like big jacks on poppers, like you will see this blitzes in Louisiana. Right, people right. People throwing poppers at the blitz, and it was just on like pretty fast. But I had an issue, like that wasn't happening over here. Over here you have a couple of fish around the year, and that's it. I mean, yep. they do get school up during mullet run, they come in, they they come in early in the morning into the mullet school and they eat everything through. I've seen it where you have like 200, 300, 500 jacks around the same size, eating all the way through 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 school and he's just cooking a fish. Getting it out, hooking yeah. it out, and getting broken up, and so on. And I started with like a medium size tackle, like uh, 5,500, 6,500, um, like eight foot rods, star rods. I started using that, and then I was I was fishing the beaches and and like the the inlets, the sea walls, and I was hooking into this big jacks and. I had the same problem as everywhere else, as everybody else before. I was hooking the jacks and I wasn't landing. Yeah. 
Yeah. I was hooking them on lures and I wasn't landing them at all. Like the hooks would bend out, the poppers would snap in soon. I was getting smoked. And I'm like, how do I get over it? And I'm like, yeah, right. I need to step on my gear, you know? And then um, I, on 2018, there was a motor run going on and I I messaged one mm, this one guy that used to fish at my local inlet. And I really looked up to him because, like, w when you're, like, 15, 16, 17 years old, you kind of, like, match up with other people your age are doing. Yeah. And what they were doing is 40-pound braid, 60-pound leader at most, on a jig and catching snooks. But I, had, I was bored of snooks. I, mm -hmm. I had already caught 45, 46-inch snooks before. I Jeez. wasn't into that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and I was trying to figure out, like, what's the next level in this? Because, like, it can be a 6,500 size reel and an 8 foot rod and me getting smoked. So I started fishing with him. And the first night that, that I, that I, that I fished with him, he's like, here, hold this rod, try it out. When I look at it, it was a 20,000 size reel. I'm like, what do you use this thing for? He's like, oh, Jack, Starp and Snook. And I'm like, no way. He, he gave me the, the soft rod. He put it like in between my legs like that. You know how you fish a soft rod? Yeah. And he's like, here, hold it. I'm going to pull on it so that, so that you can see how strong it is. You pull on it. And I was getting dragged in. I'm like, wow, this is what I need. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that night, he, I mean, I, I was I was, I was was hooking the fish, but I couldn't land it. And they were tying me up on the on the rocks that were getting me through through the inlet that basically the inlet like at the at the size of the inlet is probably 11 foot deep but then you go into this drop where it goes to 60. yeah yeah even if you hook a fish if you don't got a strong enough drag they will cut you they will get you into that age and into that edge and if they don't get get you into the edge they're gonna tumble you up on the rocks right right so like either you have to get them out or you don't get that lure back. And I told him um his his name is JV. I I told JV JV, once I become a man, I'm gonna get that rod. <laughs> 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 once I get enough money, I'm gonna get that right, rod. Yeah. And, and that's the style that I that I want to do. Because that was that was what the big GT guys were doing. That was what JB was doing, and all the other guys that I looked up to, that's what they were doing. Yeah. And I I started talking with guys that did that, and like with my friend Danny, he used to get like big tarpon from from bridges on a rod, mm -hmm. which was like he was like getting it like a hundred fifty two hundred pound tarpon from a bridge. That's that's pretty tough. Oh yeah, yeah. And that's the gear that I needed for the bridge, for the inlet, for the beach. So I got myself a, a Falkinga, which is this one right here. You're probably oh, seeing yeah. familiar. Yes. Um, dog fight. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've seen him in your photos. I know I zoomed yeah. in. I was like, what is this guy using to catch these things? Yeah, this is a 2,000 size um, Falkinga. Okay. Uh, or, Eight thousand. The 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 dog fights. They they go up to the eight to the eight thousand size. Okay. I like the um Stellas, the the new Saltigas, They go up to the twenty thousand. Okay. Yeah. So I started doing that, but uh, when you're new to it, if, even if you have the gear, like you you don't do as good as as. In, as um, as you expect, you know. Right, like, right. It's like starting from scratch again. Yeah. Because now, like, I was delving into this place where I was using like bait, and I was I was also getting them like on 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 a on artificial from time to time. Mm -hmm. But now I switched to the beaches and the inlets, and no one was doing that. I mean, right, to right. To this day, no one no one does it. Yeah, I I never really see it. You're like the guy no that's one, doing it. No one does it, and. Um, I really started doing during during the end of the Muller run on 2018. 
uh, I started throwing throwing poppers at night. And there was this big school of, of mullets just getting crushed, and the jacks will come in, the sharks will come in, the tarpon. And I was hooking these big jacks, and these tarpons with, with poppers. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then the blackjacks. But I, I really wasn't landing them because I had the big mm-hmm. the big reels, I had the big rods, but I, I was seriously like 50 pound braid. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was landing some of them, like the majority, like the 20, 30 pounders, but the mm-hmm. 40 pounders, they would just break me off. They would, they would, they would snap my 50 pound braid when, when I was tying the drag so it wouldn't get me to the edge of, of, of the inlet or wrap me around the rocks. Yep. So I was like, what else do I do? Because not even JB uses anything more than 50 pounds. Mm-hmm. So that's when I started getting into like, I stepped aside from what was expected to use into something that I myself created and now other people use it. Yeah, yeah. I said, this is not going to happen anymore. So I switched up to 80 pound braid. I got, which I got broken off in a couple of times. I lost very big fish on, on 80 pound braid, a mm-hmm. hundred pound braid. And I did got broken off once on a hundred pound braid with, with Jack Eye. The problem is, when you're fishing with like the poppers of this size, you know, most of those fish, I mean, you could, you could cast really far, but let's say that you are from like a seawall, a jetty, the beach, those fish right, are yeah. not far out. They're pretty close to shore. Yeah. They're hugging the rocks. They are swimming close to that seawall, waiting for a mullet to get close. So that they can use the seawall as an ambush point. The okay. bait can go, I mean, the bait can move like, south or north mm-hmm. but like most of the time it's going to hold the seal and move into one direction and that's what the jack is it, going to use and he's going to grab in there imagine yep. one mullet versus six seven jacks one jack cuts from from the front another one for the back another one from any other direction that it's over for that moment yep i've seen that happen with snook i've seen that happen with bluefish mackerel even smaller jacks a big pack of jacks will come in and they won't eat anything. Even on the bridge, I was I was hooking snook on while trying to catch moonfish. The jacks will come in and they will eat the snook. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I figured that, like I I wasn't really into this this big power at the beginning. You so, you kind of it, grow into the style. Explain to people who might not be watching but listening what you're holding there, like. You know, cause some people uh, are only gonna be listening to this, but you've got a gigantic popper in your hand, <laughs> like the uh, kind of stuff like you said that you see people like in like Polynesia throwing for GTs. Yeah. So in like 2017, I was using this, and this was a very big lure for me. And what? That's like a what? Like a, a five inch. This is spook? a five inch and spook. Yeah. I upgraded the hooks on it, and this was the biggest lure that I would throw. Right. But as you get into the game, into the big fish mentality, you realize that the big fish, the big snook, the big jack, they would rather eat a chunk, which is easier. Mm-hmm. They would rather eat a really big bait one time and then chill for like three or four days. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. The big fish, they are not going to be as aggressive as the 20 pound, like the 40 pound jacks, they won't be as chasers as the 20 and 30 pound jacks. Cause what happens is the 20 and 30, they're faster. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to eat more baits, but I've seen many times where there is this 15, 17 inch mullet getting hit on, 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 on a, on a seawall, getting chewed up, but yet nothing can eat it. And that's when the big jack comes in. I'm like, all right, it's my turn. Right. Yeah. <laughs> And that's what I did. I mean, I was, I was, I was throwing this, but imagine throwing this thing on an inlet when it's rough at night. Nobody's gonna see it. Right. Yep. Nobody's gonna see it. So I started with uh, a popper, like a five-inch popper. Uh, this is a six-point-three. Okay. Um, I was I was using the BMC hooks. 
and I was getting the medium-sized jacks, but it was up to that. It was up to that point. As I went up in my in my in my experience and in, in my career, I realized that the, the big fish they want big baits. Yeah, I mean elephant eats peanuts, but how often can you do it? Yeah. How often can you catch a forty-pound jack on fifteen-pound mon? Is that realistic? That's why I get into this persona of I'm going heavy and I'm going to land the fish. Yep. And with the hooks that I was using before, I wasn't getting it done. So the only way was for me to use what I used to do. Lockdown Sotigas, 130 pound breed, 200 liters with an, with an FG. I tie the the FG a lot. That's 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 my main knot. Uh, that's two hundred pound mono. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. uh, so you got a two hundred pound like liter of mono yeah. with an FG yeah. knot to your hundred fifty pound main line uh, braid. Yeah. yeah, and and that mono is just there to kind of like help you if they're running you around rocks or just abrasion no, resistance. No, uh, while while I was fishing for jacks with the handline, they were breaking me off on 150. Yeah. I see was so much pressure that a jack's mouth was like very, very solid. They got small teeth, but they can cut. Right, right. So when you set a hook on it, like when a fish eats very close to you, it's a big bait and you pull really hard, you gotta up you gotta add up the pressure that the fish is putting against you and the one that you're that you putting also when you pull. Right. So if a fish swallows the bait the whole way, now he's got the mono in his mouth and you do one big pull on it, because you gotta set the hook very hard, it's got like very tough mouth. Mm -hmm. What's gonna happen is boom. And you're yeah. gonna get shaped on 150. And people they don't understand that because if you have a 45 hundred size reel and like a mm, 17 to 30 um, pound rod, that's never gonna happen because the rod is yeah. gonna bend too much. You're gonna have a lot of leverage and it's never gonna happen. Yeah. But when you use heavy tackle, when I hook those jags, I mean it's so much pressure that they jump. They 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 try to take off like so hard. Yeah. And there's this block drag. Like they try to go down and they go whoop. Oh. Just pulls them up. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the funnest thing ever because like you have the power now. This isn't the time where they were eating your lure and they were smoking you and you couldn't land them and you couldn't know what to do. This is the time when you have figured out what you did like years before. Figure them out. Mm -hmm. And now you actually go and target them. My first year with, with lures, I got more jacks than the two years behind that I was using by B. Right. So like that was that was um, in, like, incredible for me. And my dad couldn't even believe it because I, I used to get home, you know, and he would tell me, hey, bring a jack. I will bring a jack today. And three three days later, I'll bring another, uh, another like 35 pound jack. And then he's like, how are you getting this? Because I know yeah. you're, like, you're, you're not fishing on the bridge. So like, how is it? And that's when, that's when you get to, to kind of learn which pots are better yeah. than, than others. Like a lot of people ask me like, what do you fish? What do you fish? What do you fish? I mean, <laughs> you gotta, like if you want to catch northern snakeheads, you gotta be on 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 that land. You gotta be on that yep. uh, on that pond. If you want to catch the eight the eight ten pound bass, you gotta go to to a lake that had, that holds a specific amount of um, uh, bait or to a healthy lake mainly. Yeah. For that for that fish to grow into into that size, because it's it's. It's really hard to to go to like a to go like a um, spool like um you know like somewhere that you wouldn't ex expect a big fish to 
to to grow in. There right, is there right. enough prey, there is there enough space. You kind of have to go to those spots and and that's that's where I figure. I mean, I if if I wanted to catch those really big fish, I'm gonna have to find where are the best spots. Yeah. And that's done by going as often as you can. You gotta go there, you gotta and you gotta figure out what are the factors into into those big fish. Yeah. What are they eating? When are they eating? Did they already ate? Did did you think that you missed the bite? Like what's what's the bait around? Are they there? Like jacks, they are they are always on the move. So like right, right. The main thing that you gotta do is find find a partner on those fish. I I have a beach that then I go to, and those jacks they go there very early in the morning when it's rough. Only when it's rough. Like if you go there a day before and it's a little bit calm, you will never find them. Okay. Like people will either put drones. You can do anything. They they won't be there. But when the water conditions are at um, at the speed, like you got rock water, you got the toothpaste, watercolor. That's when the bluefish come in to feed. That's when the small snook they get comfortable with feeding. That's when the macro come in to feed. And then that's when the big school of jacks like comes out of nowhere and eats everything up. Yeah, that's interesting because um, I I know I'd seen I noticed that in your pictures is like when I look at your pictures it it is you're never out there on what looks like a nice calm peaceful day no, it always looks like no. giant waves crashing because I don't I, I had wondered like how the hell are you working the popper in that like and I that was kind of part of it too is like how are you are you seeing the fish are you throwing out they're just you just know that they're there or like how are you kind of like verifying it like that's, when you scan the water is it just kind of a guessing game based on your knowledge and your experience uh, or are you seeing them it's it's an, it's a it's a mixture so that's that's when i go back to i will never be able to use this anymore for those big fish i can't because in that big water it's not gonna get noticed and right, even right. if it does you're gonna catch a five ten pound fish and i don't want that yeah, yeah. I want to go into the big fish, into the fish that I really want to catch. Because, like, that's that's a problem with people. They they say, "Oh, I want a forty-five inch snook. I want a forty-pound jack." Yeah, but are you there when the bite is happening? Are you using what the fish want? Most of the time, they're fitting into a big macro. Those 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 big jacks they want to eat once, and. With reason, like it's very hard for a jack when it's calm and clear mm -hmm. to trap a bait. They can't really trap a bait because what I've learned is that the 40 pound jacks, 45 pound jacks, they will only hang out with fish of their size. You wouldn't see a yeah. 40, 45 pound jack hanging with 20 pound. Right. That that never really happens. And I saw <laughs> that at the bridge when I when I told you earlier about that night that I've Put the mullet in, and two of them about the same size. The biggest that I have seen came at the came right there on it. And I've seen that every time during the mullet run, you see the small school of jacks coming in, destroying the fringy mullets, but the big jacks are not are not there at all. Right, right. So what happens is when it gets like really rough, you got the southeast wind or the northeast. That's when those big fish they will they will use that in in their advantage. And when they're feeding on on big bluefish, like three, four pound bluefish, macro, like big size macro, um, snook. I've seen them in snook before. Yeah. I've seen them even chase a a baby nurse shark on, oh, the, on, the, yeah. on the shore. <laughs> this is the only thing that you can throw to get those fish attention, you know? This is what will get noticed, and it's a big lure. It's like a, with the hooks, with the... Now that These popper looks DKK. like it, and you're holding a giant popper there. It looks like it has taken a hell of a beating. Do you normally yeah. fish it with just one hook there on the back, or no, no? I I do this on purpose a lot so that I could show you a tip on on how to rig the hooks. Okay. A lot of people they just rig them, like it's fine. Yeah, and it will be fine for most of the time. Most of the jacks that I catch, I always catch them on the same hook. There are six hooks in here. Most of the time, I always get them on this hook right here. Okay. The same hook. Yeah. Like, you will see that. 
<laughs> my Dremelos, <laughs> two of them are sharp, and one of them is messed up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you will see that very often. And that comes with the placement of, of the hook. You see that this hook is fishing like that. Okay. And this hook would always face the front. So you will put it on split ring. This is a 250 pound split ring. Okay. And the hook is a BKK T Rex. Uh, no, BKK GT Rex and size and six off. It's huge. Yeah, these are monster hooks for anybody that's just here, listening. I, I did it wrong. You see that you got two in front of it. Like many people would think that this is two is better, but no, those those fish actually actually miss it over here. And if they they and if they do get hooked on one, and then the other, then they would use that as, as the as the leverage. So like. So what yeah, you're trying to do is you're trying to get one point of contact that's like kind of facing the front side of the one popper. Point. One point of contact, yeah. So like this. See the hook facing that way? Okay. Yeah, I see what you mean. I always get him on this hook. And as you can see on the popper, most of the bites are on the head. Right, yeah. When, the, when a big fish would eat like a macro or a bluefish, they will rarely start with the tail. You will see that with mm, pythons. You you will see that with just about every predator. They right, start right. with the head and swallow it down. Mm -hmm. So that's why I get most of my bait throw here. That's interesting. That's that's now that is a good like detailed experience yeah. tip there. I want to touch on one thing interesting about just jacks, just in general. It's kind of an interesting dynamic with that species of fish. And so there's like some parallels with like why my interest is kind of in this style of fishing is, you know, in, in freshwater, especially freshwater, it seems like there's a, a big divide between what's considered a sport fish, what's considered like an other fish or a trash fish or an unwanted species. Yeah. And then I noticed since I've come to the coastline, saltwater's kind of got that. But very interestingly to me is for whatever reason, it seems like Jack's are kind of cast into that same category. I'm curious, like, your opinion, and I think some of what you've shed light on, the fact that they're probably breaking a lot of people off. People are yeah. probably getting spooled. They're probably losing their favorite lures. They're yeah. probably just, just, their rods are breaking. The gears are burning out on their reels. Why, why mm -hmm. do you think the disdain for a fish that clearly grows so big, fights so hard, I mean, that can be, uh, uh, I don't know, enjoyed I, by anybody i i i think that um i mean i've always had that i've always had that always i've always heard negative criticism about jack and i've always heard the hype about snooks i've always heard the hype about tarpon even 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 bonefish yeah people who love bonefish okay but i think is that like it's a market-based um, fishery. Nowadays, everything is visual. It's like I'm, I'm, I'm probably the only guy in my area that throws popper. And I think that I'm the only guy that fishes the heaviest for Jack in Florida. As, as, yeah. you, as, as you might tackle. That's, so like, that's definitely what I have seen just looking through the internet. Is, is, yeah, I don't like, know. I, You're like I, sitting on the I, top of that mountain i fish the habits for jacks and because i really want to get the biggest jacks and like what people perceive the idea of jacks is that five pound jack that is crazy and that would hit any lure and they're an easy fish mm. put everything switches when a jack reaches to the 40 pound size now i've i've, I've had people that are snook fishermen like hardcore snook fishermen they're like man I'm tired of this. I want something that pulls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, look at you. And then they want to fish with me. And when they come, they're, they're fishing with 60-pound leaders and all of that. And yeah, they're getting yeah. smoked. They can't land the fish. They, they, they're getting smoked. And they, they, they either, like, fall in love with it. Like, they go at it. Like, a bunch of nights in and then and then and then. Or they just back up completely. Because, like, the big jacks, they... they they're wearing even as 
as common as in, as in it used to be. You can, you can talk to the old timers and and like in Palm Beach or Boynton where and like the earlier 2000s where we had more seawalk and less docks and more mullet run. There were bigger schools of jacks and people were getting their the records. They were getting like 40 funding partners. It was it was easier back then, but now they have due to due to the due to the fact that like or due to the belief that, that there are a lot of them they mainly got used for um, shark bait um, yeah yeah chum commercial fishing and on and on and since they were easier to catch there was a lot of them and and into the into the market and another thing is that jacks they 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 have red meat so like the only real incentive for for the jacks is like to have some fun you know because like they are not really good eating, and the five pounders are kind of easier to catch. So people discard yeah. it as, as trust fish completely. Right. But when you change into the size of the jack, you you realize right. that it's very very hard to get. Well, there it's very is. hard, and when you do, you gotta have the right tackle for it. Yeah. It's gonna smoke you. Yeah. It's well, the way you're it doing it, it's it's uh uh. It's it's so awesome looking because you mentioned earlier like the guys over there in Australia and, and where they're you know fishing for GTs. It's basically like our version of a GT. I mean, you're mm -hmm. you're using similar, if not the exact same tactics. You're catching yeah. a fish that has the same eye appeal, has the same sporting qualities. It's essentially almost the same fish, maybe minus not getting quite to the same size. But I think the experience and the pursuit of going after that kind of fish, like there's so many parallels there. And I yeah. think more people like me who, who see what you're doing are going to like, I feel like that's could catch on. Maybe that's a bad thing for you. I don't know. You, you're kind of in a good position right now where you've like cornered that market of fish, but, uh, but I'm, I'm, uh, I, I don't know. I, I know we're winding down on time here, which, which stinks. Cause I may have to bring you back on. Cause I, I, we didn't even, we didn't even get into using poppers to catch sharks, which is like, I feel like that's a topic in and of itself. Yeah. But the, the Jack's thing is it's, mainly, it's out, outrageous. Yeah. yeah mainly with, with sharks also, it's, you're looking for the same condition, the exact yeah. same condition. You're looking for that in rough weather. And what happens is they say that you got a school of bluefish. They will be feeding on like bait or whatever. But once those Jacks come around, those bluefish freak out. They go on the surface. Yeah. Blacks will come in, the jacks will come in, and they will tear everything up. <laughs> now, the the sharks they don't attack the jacks; they will hunt together. They, that is crazy. They, they they wouldn't bite each other. I have I've, I've seen that happen multiple yeah. times. They wouldn't bite each other. They hunt together. But the moment that you hook a jack, even if it's big and that shark senses the vibration, oh of the trash, yeah, yeah, it would get sharp. And that's why I also use. 400 and even 600 pound mono. Yeah, like, I saw your um, videos of you tying knots with 400 pound yeah. line. That's interesting yeah. there. Yeah, I can, I can, I can tie a, a knot like pretty easy on a lure with 600. Yeah. Or do an FG with 600 to 100 pound braid. And you prefer that over just using like a, like a, I don't know, a crimp, like. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, if if I can tie a knot over here, I mean. In my opinion, my my knots are stronger than than the crimp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't have to depend on anything else. I with with my skill, I can just tie the knot. I'm ready to fish. I need to switch out the lures. I I also use these. But I got the idea from from the guys in in Australia, which is a sonic ring. Okay. And then a split ring, and then and then I I will pass a. One of these to it, and then I can switch lures in and out, or I can use like a tactical angle split. Yeah, yeah. And then I can switch the board. So with the sharks, it's mm, it's 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 very similar. There are there are times when I think that I have oh to to like wrap it up. Uh, last year on December, the water got really rough. The bluefish were in, the mackerel were in. There were some big jacks and some and some big blackfish as well. I. I was I was I was catching both fish and 
Medicast, bring in the pauper, bring it in. The black tip comes in, hits the pauper, starts right. jumping, starts <laughs> line starts going out. You got to go very, very light, like drag. Now it's the opposite. We actually got to go tight drag. Don't let them pull, because they'll get you around the rock. But with black tip, since it's too much, and then jumping on, you got to go light. You got to yeah, hook yeah. them, let them freak out, let them do its thing, let it jump around. After the first run, then most likely you're gonna come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that day, I met a cast, hooked a big flag, and started jumping everywhere. Mid fight, I'm like, this thing, like this fish, like grew, like he got stronger. Yeah. <laughs> bring it in, bring it in, and when I bring it up, it's a forty pound jack. I'm like, how did this happen? Yeah. <laughs> 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 the jack took the lure out of the black fish's mouth. Oh my gosh! And now you have I a video of that jack. on your Instagram, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. And I, yeah, I saw that because you were going wild and crazy over yeah. uh, over that happening. So. Yeah, and I, I I never expected that. And that's when you know, like they they really hunt together and they would compete with each other. Right. They they want the same kind of situations. They're gonna use it as an advantage to eat. And on the calm base where they can't really eat. She's gonna lay down on that and, and feed off of that restored fat that they have, and just wait yeah. for that day to go off again. Now, there are times where it's not rough for like a month or two months, and that's when night fishing comes in. Mm -hmm. Now, those fish they can't feed during the day, but if you go at night to where there's a lot of current or to to where like the bridges, the inlets, when you know that it's a fish highway, the fish have to go there regardless. Yeah, yeah. They're going to be swimming with the eyes up like that, just <laughs> going fast and just looking for a valley who to skip the surface, anything. That's when the popper comes in. There's a lot of splats out at nighttime, the big poppers. I mean, this one, or you can use those, you can just say stick bait. This is how oh, yeah. stick bait. Jesus, uh, look at that thing. DK case with, for, for everything. This, this hook, they got a lot of potential in the Florida market. I feel, I feel like I'd be afraid. To hook a shark with the treble hook, like I don't, I'm, I'm curious how you'd even get that out of there. Um, but uh, yeah, with the with the big case, since they have a very small bar, okay, barbless, yeah, yeah, or, or no, it's yeah, a small or bar, a okay, I see. Barb, yeah. yeah, it's it's actually easier to 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 get them out. So or you're buying you those hooks, you're buying those hooks separately, and then adding them to the popper. Uh, wait, what? You're you're buying those hooks separately yeah. and then adding yeah. them. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, yeah, I. I, I buy them from upstate because they in, in here like nobody really uses the BKK unless yeah, you want yeah. or tarpon or that's it that's that's the market for them tarpon because like nobody really use targets jacks or black tips on on the BKKs they 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 prefer to do a single hook and like a seven inch popper something that they can have fun with with like mm, a light reel that the shark can 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 jump and all and yes yeah. that's that's really fun too. Well, well, I know we're going to start winding this one down. I hate to, but I, I, I will say, I mean, now living in Florida, I, obviously there's so many types of fishing that you can do in this state. And just, yeah. just for me personally, and just the whole landscape that we have in this state and all the opportunities to catch different kinds of fish or do different styles of fishing. I'm not lying when I tell you, like what you're doing over there with those gigantic jacks, throwing those huge lures in that rough, yeah. crazy water, that's probably... The number one thing that I want to experience here. So, and I hope to do that soon. I just recently yeah. bought like a setup, although you kind of like let, I don't know. You, I feel like I I'm saw, already messed I up. Some of it. Yeah. Well, I spooled up with 80 pound braid and then you said all yeah. that. I was like, damn it. I was like, no, oh, it no. Is, but, it is good. It is good. When you're fishing from, from the beach, it is good. Okay. 80 is plenty enough, man. And even like for the beach, like you will be okay with 65. But, yeah. There are beaches that you have plain sand. Yep. And even if it's rough, there's nothing there to attract bait or predators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those baits are going to be piled up on a bar made out of rocks. Right, right. The front where they will come in. They're not going to get so beat up by by the waves. That's when the jack will come in. And that's where we, when you hook them, they will wrap you on a rock. They will they will cut you on the on the edge of a jetty. Yep. They, that's when that's when the the things that you want to avoid. That's when that's when you face them. And when you hook them, you gotta get them out. 
because yep. you want you want to land the big fish. You you want you want to uh, as as I say as become a better fisherman by catching the bigger size fish because that's because that's a true test. You can say that you're amazing, but at the same time you don't catch a big fish. And right, right. The big ones will years. always humble you. Uh, so yeah, but yeah, man, that's one I want to do very soon. I'm, I'm a little busy the next couple of weekends, but I'm really eager to get over there. So if I do either, I'll try to join you or I'll be picking your brains, texting you like crazy, asking just for tips on the fly. Yeah, yeah, sure. But man, that's a, that's a big one. I was curious. So I wanted to ask like, like a final questions. If you like, what is on your, I think we all have them, but what is like your bucket list trip? If you had the money and you had the finances to go anywhere right now, tomorrow, to board a plane, what would be would do, your trip? I would do um, right now. I would do um, two two trips. One okay. is to go to Argentina and get the dorados on the on the big dam. The, oh they yeah, have yeah. On poppers. Have you seen those videos? Where yes, I've got some. Go I've got some connections that run those tours. But yeah, that's yeah. that's an awesome one. Yeah, that one and the right there with you. Definitely um, Australia, Australia for the big GTs on the big GTs on the on the reefs. You know what's amazing about those rocks is like they're getting marlin from the rocks. They're getting those big like I mean they're getting all kinds of flagic fish from land. But yeah, I'm right there with you. That's uh, yeah. that is some of the coolest videos out there on all of like the social thing. But uh, but anyway, you're doing something similar here in Florida, and I'm telling you, yeah. anybody that's listening, if you want to see, I mean, you have to see the size and caliber of the jacks that this guy's catching. But if somebody <laughs> wants to see that, like, where would they find you? What's, what's like your Instagram? Where can they go to, to contact you? Or... Uh, David Rocca, David underscore Rocca with two C's. Okay. So there's R O C C A. Yeah. All right. Well, David, man, I really appreciate your time. You, you may be a guy because you're very fluid with your conversation. I yeah. wasn't having to provoke you to tell me your story and very fascinating story. One of like, very yeah, humble beginnings. So, man, your your story of like I, where you came from, your progression as an angler, and I want to mention one more t- thing too because I circled mm-hmm. it and I put a star next to it because it was very impactful to me. That scenario where you had sort of a negative encounter with other maybe more um, established or or uh, equipped anglers that was sort of like a negative experience. So you're a young guy still trying to learn, yeah. and they they gave you a hard time. That's something that I feel like you could touch on even deeper, but like, I I don't know, man, like the people that are listening, like, I feel like we have a social responsibility to the younger people that are coming up that if you're approached by a young person who's eager and interested and like they're wide open, like they're just, they're just open, ready for you to like plant that seed. Mm -hmm. It is like our responsibility as real stewards of fishing and the outdoors to be like a voice of reason, not somebody that's, yeah. says hey you're supposed to be an a-hole or hey this is what you know this is what you act like when you learn what you're doing because it it passes on a real negative vibe so i hated mm-hmm. hearing that but at the same time you're a guy who clearly paved your own path and did things the hard way so at least yeah. i know you weren't impressionable to the point that's like okay well whatever i'm gonna i'm gonna do it my way regardless that's that's pretty pretty awesome yeah, yeah. um the the way that i've learned is definitely by by example by example yep. and before people used to fish for jacks like that but not at the le- at least that I, as i mm, as i'm aware not at the level that i do and i always take my time to to teach people something you know yep. i i yep. get questions all the time how to use it and my best advice is if you want the big fish if like if you close your eyes and you, you see yourself catching that big fish, forget about what is known or what is expected. Find your own way into that into catching that fish that you want. If even if that means make your own lure, fishing your own way, at the end of the day, like when you're 70, 80, 80 years old, what's gonna matter is like, wow, I, I really worked hard and I got the big fish, you know, and I had fun doing it and I taught others how to fish as well. You know, and I grew as a person and I help also other people to mm, mm, to grow in the in the fishing community. Because a lot of guys they're they're good at what they do, but they wouldn't look at you. Yep. They don't 
look at anybody else, they, they want to catch, mm, like, a, they want to do their own, and they wouldn't take any time into helping us, like, they're making a mistake. Uh, here, like, this is a way that you could work it better. I have a night where I'm fishing with poppers, and there's the new guy that comes in. He sees me fishing with poppers, and he can't get anything. I, I told him, hey, here's a popper. Yeah. That's how my my two friends that, that fish with me, that's how they got their biggest jacks. I gave him pop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My my friend Mike, as as as, as, in, as you know him, he the fish were biting. He got broken off because he was using fifty pound braid. <laughs> he yeah, yeah. the gun. He lost his poppers. He looked at me like, yeah, just grab whatever you want. Just grab one. I tie him up for him. Met a cast. He got like a forty pounder on 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 December. Right. Well, that's awesome, man. I got to jump off of here. I got another guy lined up in a little bit but sure. uh i don't know you, if oh if you're willing you may be a guy that i i reach out to to, to bring back on because dude your your story is awesome and it's been yeah. really cool getting to know like the man and like the actual human being behind the instagram photos yeah. i mean that's that's why i started this thing it's it's we need to get back to having these real conversations and not just existing behind social media clicks likes yeah. comments things like that so i really appreciate your time man thank you very much david you have a good one. Talk to you later. Yeah, thank you.